Twitter. Twitter. San Francisco. Everything you're about to see and hear is true. Real cops, real cases compiled from actual events. Police stories told by the cops who lived them and will remember them the rest of their lives. I've been involved in law enforcement for 25 years, and I really believe that when you take the oath to protect and serve, you have to do it. You can't always pick and choose who you're going to protect and serve. If you do, you're prostituting the profession. I work what they call the action shift. It's 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Sort of an odd time, but that's where we have most of our problems. Just before midnight, I had a Signal 7 call. That's a fight in progress. I've got a pretty good martial arts background, so this is usually not a problem for me. It was a bar right over the Ohio Pennsylvania state line. We've had quite a few calls there over the years, some even involving gunplay. There's always something going on. Looks like we've got a bad one, Bob. Wayne, this place is always bad. Brookfield 205, we've got a code five, code five at the Alpine. 205, Brookfield 205, we've got a code five, code five. Do you copy? This is the worst place in the world for a section. This is a real dump, dimly lit. Look like the bar scene from Star Wars. First thing we see is a black male with his shirt torn. What's your story? You the stripper here? I'm the... Now, who you been fighting with here? Feisty little fella, huh? I know this guy. Let's separate him. I'll take him outside. Let's go, brother. Look, you want to take a ride in the car? Ain't no damn Pennsylvania cop taking me anywhere. No way, man. You don't even know where you are. This is Ohio. Now, why don't you put that down so we can sort this out? Come on, you damn pen cop. I'll beat your brains out. Ohio, can't you remember that? Come on! Bob! Bob, out here, push! Excuse me. Much as I hated to, I had to disengage with this guy. But I felt Dwayne's life was in jeopardy. When I got outside, the other guy had him against the wall. It took both of us to get him under control. Dwayne cuffed him. Get him cut! I'm trying, I'm trying! Get him cut! Get him! What's in hell? Get him cuffed! I'm trying! I'll kill you! He bit down on me like a pit bull and was hanging on. I had my right hand on my weapon, tried to retain it. And I couldn't let it go with my left hand. That would only break the hold on the black guy. We finally got the black man cuffed. His wrists were so big, Dwayne had to use a second set of cuffs. Cuffing one set to another to hold them. Another cruiser rolled in, and they took him to the car. While my hand was bleeding, I went back in after the other guy. Who wants to be with me now, huh? Huh? What's going on? What are you looking at? You had enough of this. You want to call us tonight? Come on, come on. You don't want to do anything the easy way, do you? Ah! Ah! Must have flipped to maybe ten feet. When I went around the bar to finish him off, didn't even phase him. Ah, I don't believe it. So far, so good, right? I let him into the car, but he started kicking at me. Meanwhile, the other guy was trying to kick out the windows of Dwayne's cruiser. You could actually see the dents in the roof of the car. It was about four miles to the station. He kept gagging and choking the whole way. I thought he was faking, but I pulled over to make sure. Discovered he swallowed his tongue, I had to reach into his mouth and pull it out. He was transferred to a waiting ambulance, which took him to the Sharon Medical Center in Pennsylvania. It was the closest. Then one of the paramedics said he couldn't read any respiration or pulse. They stabilized him, and then the doctors took over while I called the Pennsylvania State Police to see if they can ID him. Look, Sarge, he's got no ID. He's got no car. Someone had to drop him off. And just because he keeps calling you a Pennsylvania cop doesn't mean we'd know about him. Well, you got a better place to start? 
Hold on. Shut this down. That sounds like Aubrey. You got Aubrey Riddle there. Not trying to. Watch it off, Aubrey. I know who you are. Keep him, so they told me to take him. Three of us carried him out, sort of like an alligator. One holding a towel around his face, one with his cuffs, and the other on his leg shackles. The doctors taped his mouth shut, but he chewed through that before we can get the door closed. And he started spitting at everybody and saying how he was going to kill us with our own guns. We got him to Brookfield, and I had to maze him, but he still wouldn't quit. It didn't affect him at all, but it was a wasted trip. Our cells were full. We called everywhere and finally got clearance from McDonald, Ohio, 15 miles away. We got there about 0330. Same story. It took three of us to carry him out. What the hell's this guy on? I don't know, but as soon as we get his cuffs off, we're getting out of here. Hey, well, there's nobody else here, so I'm going to give him full run of the cell block. The more room, the better. Ready? Let's go. 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 You damn big cops, I'm going to kill you. I thought I was done for the night. I signed him over and someone offered me a cup of tea. Oh, thanks. Sure. It's hot. What the? What's going on now? Riddle found a lighter rolled up on one of these mattresses. He piled some mattresses against the door and he lit them. Now they're out of control and we're not coming in and get them. He was pretty concerned. Actually, no one was talking about rescuing him, and I'm thinking I'll give it one shot. It didn't cross my mind not to try. I had to get him out. I made it up in here! Give me the flashlight and key right now! Well, get the hell out of here! Give me the flashlight and key! Call the fire department! Hurry up! The door was red hot, buckled from the heat. I couldn't turn the lock either way, even using both hands. I couldn't breathe. And he was done screaming, so I figured he was done. But now I had to give it one more try. Riddle! <coughs> Riddle! Where are you? My breathing was totally done. I was dizzy, and I thought I was done, too. I was a dead man. Riddle! All I could think about was my Riddle! wife. How angry she was going to be at me for dying the stupid way. Riddle! Then I ran right into him. I figured I'll give this one last shot. I started thinking, the way this night's going, I'll be in here dead and this sucker's going to walk out alive. Part of me wanted to make sure he went with me. In the back here was something pulled the door shut. The others had gone for help and I couldn't budge the door. It was jammed. I couldn't touch the handle. I was locked in. I decided to give a skip back kick into it. With my size and 30 years of martial arts and training, I figured if it doesn't go, I'm going to be finished anyhow. I got him outside, the lake swept him to the ground. That's the last thing I remember. Next thing I knew, I was in the hospital. It wasn't very pleasant for Riddle after that. No one was really thrilled with him. They transported him to the already full county jail and arraigned him the next day. He was still combative. Was this guy worth it? I don't know. But I've always believed you can't try to be a hero. If you do, you'll be dead. I teach in my academies to give it an honest attempt. If you feel you're risking your own life, disengage, break off, live the fight another day. And you can't choose who you're going to protect and serve. Sometimes you have to save the bad guys, too. We'll be right back with Officer Domingo Rico and the boy who wanted to end it all. Top Copsy is brought to you in part by Go Greyhound and leave the driving to us. Duff Moisturizing Body Wash for some... Women get penis. So how are you, dead? Gentlemen. Oh. I'm out. Wait for Rishis. Winston Cookie. I've got it. Chocolama. What about you, Hurley? Oh, Leo. Hurley, you're a genius. Got milk? And now, Domingo Rico and the boy.
boy who wanted to die. Some days you come to work mentally and physically fatigued. You're battered and bruised. And you wonder, why do I put up with all this? When you become a cop, they tell you, your job is to serve and to protect. And initially, you really don't know what that means. But then you do something which has that effect, and you realize that everything you go through every day means something in the long run. <laughs> single parent, and the owners of the complex got on her about replacing the items he'd vandalized. She'd agreed to do that, but she also wanted us to have a talk with her son. Corey Pierce? Yes. I'm Officer Rico. And this is Officer Drake. My mom's at work. She already paid for the lights. We know. She also asked us to have a talk with you. Do you mind if we come in? Do you have a choice? Yeah. It's your house. You guys want some coffee? I just made some. You're a little young for coffee, aren't you? I'm practicing. Thought I might be a cop when I grow up. <laughs> Black. One sugar. Yeah, same for me. Is that why your partners, you take your coffee the same? Could be. You mind if we sit? Go ahead. Nice place you got here. Your mom must be doing OK. Yeah, I guess. She's got a good job. She gets money from my dad, too. They're divorced? That's tough. Yeah. Do you see your dad much? No. He lives in Texas. Last time he came to visit, I was 11. Do you have anybody else you can talk to? You know, when you got problems you need to talk to somebody about? My mom, I guess. What about friends at school? No. School's pretty stuck up. You don't dress right or do the same thing as everybody else. They don't even talk to you. You mean if you want to have friends, you have to be part of a gang. Was that little stunt the other night your way of impressing somebody? I don't know. I guess. Well, let me tell you what I know about gangs. If somebody won't be your friend unless you're part of their gang, they're not worth having as a friend. Uh, I guess I was pretty stupid. No. I think you just made a mistake. How's the coffee? It's pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty much a straight and narrow kind of kid. We talked about what happens when you're involved in gangs and all the reasons to be successful in school instead. We tried to get him interested in after-school activities, particularly sports, and we promised we'd speak to his mother about sending him to Texas to visit his father. All in all, it was a pretty good talk. I didn't think I'd ever have a run-in with him again. I want to show you something. What? Just come and see. Well, let me get some of these things inside first. No, it's important. Okay. Okay. So, what's the big surprise? You'll see. Watch. 
much. Corey, don't. I can't. Bleaching action. Parker was off, so I was working alone that day. I was in the middle of my shift. 61 Mary 5, respond to 1192 Brightside Court for possible 1056 A in progress. 61 Mary 5, I'm two blocks away. 61 Mary 5, contact the reporting party, Greg Orr, who advises that a juvenile has possibly hung himself in the garage. 61 Mary 5, copy on route. The address didn't ring a bell, and I responded immediately in hopes that fire and ambulance people will already be there to assist me. Melter had lifted him up while another neighbor, Adrian Gregor, loosened the rope. By the time I got there, 10 or 12 minutes had passed since he stepped off. Excuse me? Officer, he tried to hang himself. He's not breathing. I know this kid. I knew he was probably not alive. His face was blue and his neck had rope burns on it. What should we do? Do you know how to do mouth to mouth? Let me show you. This is what I want you to do. Keep his head back, pinch his nostrils closed. Seal your mouth over his and blow like you're filling up a balloon. Got it? One breath every five seconds. Count it to yourself in thousands, understand? He'd been out for a long time, and our chances of reviving him were slim, but we had to try. I'd been a policeman for 10 years, and I'd never had to perform CPR on anybody. Every year, we are recertified, and the minute I needed the training, it all came back to me. Mr. Melter and I worked at a rate of 12 breath cycles and 60 chest compressions a minute. We worked on the boy nonstop for five or six minutes. It seemed like forever, every minute was an eternity. By making a suicide attempt in front of someone else, I was certain Corey wanted somebody to stop him. But it hadn't worked out that way. The ambulance and fire people still weren't there. I was tempted to get on the radio, but I couldn't stop what I was doing. It's not working. Don't stop. Give 911 another call, tell him to hurry. A lot of things go through your mind. You realize, hey, if this was my kid, what would I do? I thought about the counseling and all the problems he was facing. I wondered if what I'd said had gotten through to him or if his problems had just seemed impossible to solve on his own. He seemed like a decent kid, smart and articulate. I didn't understand what could have made him come to this decision. I can't tell you how badly I wanted to save him. He started spitting up a bunch of mucus. We cleared his airway. We were about to start CPR again when the fire department arrived. How are you doing? I think we got him going again. Even with a rescue unit on the scene, with medical help and oxygen, pulling him through would be touch and go. Learning CPR is as simple as calling your local police and fire station. And in a situation like this, seconds make the difference. The time it had taken me to get here is all the time Corey needed to die. But he didn't. We got the kid into an ambulance and took him to the hospital. Then the fire captain told me we'd probably saved his life. I can't tell you how happy words like that make you feel. A few days later, Corey's mother called me and said he was out of the woods. He was going to be okay. Four months later, I was forced to shoot and kill an armed suspect. When something like that happens, you do a lot of soul searching. You ask yourself if this job is really what you want to do for the rest of your life. But in retrospect, you realize you're going to have situations like that. And you're going to have situations where you help somebody. What you go through every day really is worth it. In the end, the good always outweighs the bad. Cop Cops returns in a moment with the aftermath of these stories. 5-1-5-1. The McDonald, Ohio police station was badly damaged by the fire. Aubrey Riddle was sentenced to 18 months for aggravated arson and assault on a police officer. He is now awaiting extradition to Pennsylvania to face previous charges there. 
Officer Robert Fabry suffered severe smoke inhalation and cortical brain damage, which now affects his speech and memory. He is currently on full disability, and his career as a police officer and a martial arts instructor may have come to an end. Corey Pierce suffered minor brain damage as a result of his suicide attempt, but he survived and received counseling. His name was changed to protect his identity. Patrolman Domingo Rico received the William Polly Lifesaving Award for his actions in saving Corey's life. He is presently a field training officer and continues to serve and protect the citizens of San Jose as a member of their police department.